Panel 1. Audio Approaches to Accessible Comics. Image, a black and white drawing of sound entering an ear. Text, audio description. Panel Moderator. Thomas Reed. Panelists. Chad Allen. Rick Boggs. Charity Pitcher Cooper. Wale Subri. So it looks like uh, Thomas has had to rejoin. So I'm sure we're just having some tech problems. In the meanwhile, let's go ahead and have Charity and uh, Chad uh, kick us off with who you are and your, your quick audio descriptions of yourself, please. Absolutely. Since my mic's on, I'll um, just jump in here and go first. Yeah. Uh, my name is Charity Pitcher Cooper, and I'm here in my cluttered home office, i.e. my living room. Um, I am a light-skinned uh, woman, and I have straight brown hair with heavy bangs. I am wearing my reading glasses and a very prominent pair of blue headphones with silicone red fox ears on them. Um, and... Uh, I work um, as the project manager for Udescribe, uh, which is an accessibility tool to add audio descriptions uh, to YouTube videos. Um, so I train um, hundreds of new audio describers a year, people who have um, generally never heard of audio description, um, all the way through to um, people who are professional audio describers um, who want to use um, the tool uh, for personal projects um, or uh, sometimes even for paid projects. And so that is my background here on the panel. Thank you, Charity. Uh, Chad. You are muted. Yep. Oh, I, I unmuted you. You're good to go. Hey, everyone. My name is Chad Allen. Uh, I am an artist that happens to be blind. Uh, I am a 40-something male with fair complexion. I have a uh, mustache and beard, uh, brown eyes. I am wearing my uh, Perspective Two Blind, blind Brothers t-shirt. And there is a painting of the Yosemite Falls behind me. And then uh, the reason um, I, that I am here today is uh, obviously to promote, um, you know, accessible comics. Um, I have been involved in a project uh, since uh, late 2015, early 2016 uh, called Unseen, which I am the creator of. And it is an um, audio drama uh, about a blind uh, assassin. And uh, I was uh, given the opportunity to have it on display at the Exploratorium Museum uh, up in San Francisco in 2019 uh, for a uh, exhibit on identity. And uh, I also am going to have the opportunity to have it on display at the Palo Alto Art Center uh, coming up in September uh, for another event. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. I've worked in multiple meeting, uh, mediums. Um, I've been a competitive tap dancer as a child. I was a fine artist. Um, I uh, am a writer and I'm also a magician. Great. And now let's hear from Wally. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, my name is uh, Wale Sabri. You can call me Wally or Wale, um, it, whatever is easier for you. I identify as blind and um, coming at you guys from New York City, um, also the unceded lands of um, the Lenape, Canarsi, and Rockaway peoples. My image description is as follows. Um, I'm a Middle Eastern man in my mid 30s with olive skin and brownish hazelish eyes. Um, and I have long, dark, curly hair that I've been growing for about a year and a half. Um, I used to use the excuse that it was pandemic hair, but I've actually been doing it on purpose. Um, <laughs> but I have it tied up in a ponytail today um, to look presentable. It's also very humid, so my hair is a little bit frizzy. Um, I'm wearing a um, long, uh, long sleeve button up uh, shirt that is, uh, has black and white horizontal stripes and currently sitting in a bedroom with a um, wall behind me. Um, 
as a professional, uh, as a professional, I work for the New York City um, Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, and I'm a digital accessibility coordinator. And um, I, uh, as I said before, I identify as blind. I'm a pop culture enthusiast. I'm an audio description enthusiast, and I like comics. Hey, can you all hear me? We can. Yes, Good we job. can hear you. Good job, you here, Thomas. Can you see me too? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. I apologize for that. I don't know what was happening, but I had to restart my machine and everything was crazy, but forgive me. Um, Just so, a quick quick note, Thomas. Yeah, this ahead. is Emily speaking. Um, uh, we're still trying to contact Rick Boggs, who I believe is on, but um, maybe signed in not under a name that's recognizable to us. Rick, if you are here and hearing this, can you either use the raise hand function or you can just message in the Q&A that you're here and then we'll know what your name is so we can get you up there too. So was that Chad Thanks. speaking just now that when I came in? That was Wale. Oh, that was Wale. I'm sorry. Sorry, Wale. Um, so can I take it over or what? Please do. <laughs> take it over and we'll, we'll try to get Rick in and I'll let you know when Rick is here. Okay. So was Wale the only one who did his intro? Sorry, Wale, Chad, and Charity. Okay, all right. Well, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I apologize to you and to everyone else because, you know, greetings, everyone. And, um, you know, I'm excited. I was, I was really excited about it. So I was like trying to get this machine going. Um, I'm really happy to be here amongst the cool creative people and, and those of us who care about access. Um, so honestly, I feel like I'm with my people. So let me just run down and, and, and do, do my, my, uh, my introduction, my self-introduction. So um, I'm, my name is Thomas Reed, and I'm, a pod, I, uh, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm the host and producer of Read My Mind Radio, which is a podcast featuring compelling people impacted by all degrees of blindness and disability. Um, I dedicate a significant amount of episodes to the topic of audio description, including critiquing, interviewing people within the industry on all all different levels. Um, I'm also a voice talent and I've provided AD consultation and narration for multiple projects, including some that are on Netflix. Um, I'm a brown skinned black man with a smooth shaven bald head, a goatee and dark shades. I'm wearing a, a black Black Panther t-shirt in light gray letters that says Wakanda forever with the arms crossed and the Wakanda salute. So you can say I'm dressed for the occasion. <laughs> I'm seated in my vocal booth in the Poconos, which is about 90 minutes west of my beloved Bronx, New York. My pronouns are he and him. Um, so let me pass the mic. Let me see, do we have Rick available yet? He is joining us very shortly, just having a tech problem too, but he is on the way. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So I would just go ahead and begin the panel. And as soon as he's okay. on, we'll let you know, and then we can, we can catch him up with an intro. Excellent, excellent. So, um, you know, when it comes to audio description or making content accessible to those who are blind or low vision, I think we probably would agree that starting from the perspective of the consumer is essential. So Wale, um, now I know you can approach this conversation from different angles, but I'm gonna ask you to focus on mainly as a, as a consumer. So why don't you start to talk a, a little bit about your, your personal history with, with comics and and your experience over the years accessing them and, and gra other graphical content. Absolutely, thank you, Thomas. Um, so my experience, I'm a 36 year old male, by FYI. Uh, my experience begins back uh, when I was in college and I was interested in comics, uh, but I couldn't read them because I didn't have access to them. Um, one of my friends was really into comics and started reading some to me. Um, we read, some uh, classical favorites like Watchmen and Sandman. And that was just a, such a wonderful experience to be able to ex, you know, consume that content in, in an accessible way. Uh, specifically Watchmen being one of, you know, it's touted as one of the best comic books of all time. Uh, and that really just got me into that world. Uh, from there, you know, I uh, started exploring audio as a medium. So I started listening to some audio books and some recordings of, you know, Edgar Allan Poe poetry and, and um, some books like White Fang and, and things like that. 
um, which eventually, uh, you know, um, that same friend that read comic books to me, let me know that there was this company called Graphic Audio that was um, creating um, audio adaptations of comic books, DC comic books. Um, and this was back probably in like 2008 or 2009, maybe 2010. Um, and so I started buying them. They were on CD at the time. And, you know, they would come like maybe like four or five CDs to a volume. And um, some of the stories that I listened to were Infinite Crisis 52, I think um, Sons of Krypton. So, you know, it, it has the DC characters that you'd be familiar with, like Superman and Green Lantern and Wonder Woman. Um, and what was cool about them is, you know, I, I only mentioned that they're audio adaptations, but they have a full cast, right? So each character has a unique voice. They have a full score. So there's music. There were sound effects um, beyond just like footsteps and doors opening and closing, you know, there were like special effects. So it was really immersive and engaging and just fun to listen to. Um, and they were, you know, taken from the graphical novel adaptations. So, you know, there would be a narrator kind of describing the story as you would, as they would if you were reading it as a book, right? Um, but then the characters would voice their own um, quotes and uh, there would be sound effects to kind of give that experience of a scene. Actually, their, their motto or, or tagline used to be, a movie in your mind. Uh, and that's what they tried to create. And, and it was fun. Unfortunately, I don't think that they have the rights uh, for DC Comics anymore. So those uh, that I mentioned, I if you go on the graphic audio website, those stories are no longer available, but they might be available on Amazon as uh, CDs. From there, I, um, you know, in, around 2010, I started getting into the world of podcasts. And um, I discovered um, Moonlight Audio Theater, uh, which creates audio theater productions sim similarly with a full cast, music, sound effects. Um, sometimes there were even just recorded live performances of plays. Um, and while it wasn't comic book focused, it was still an audio medium that really um, gave a lot um, uh, uh, you know, just a lot of ideas of what could be out there um, and how co comics could be more uh, made more accessible. Um, and, and just um, uh, on top of that, some of those uh, podcast uh, episodes were uh, you recorded using binaural sounds. Um, so if you wore headphones, you could actually sort of hear things in a 3D space as if you were uh, almost experiencing a live uh, experience of some sort. So that was a lot of fun. Um, then, you know, uh, you, my uh, experience kind of goes on to like Netflix and when they started audio describing shows like Daredevil and Jessica, J uh, um, what is that show again? <laughs> I forgot actually. Jessica Jones, uh, Jessica Jones yes. Yeah. Uh, Jessica Jones and the Defenders and, and all of those, that was fun. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to, to now, um, uh, I've, I've had some experiences on Audible. Uh, there are some Marvel uh, audio experiences on Audible. Uh, there's X-Files, uh, similarly with you know, music and sound, and it has the original actors actually uh, from the X-Files series. Very cool, very cool, sir. Okay, well, great. Um, thank you so much, Wale. What I think we want to do next is to, um, do we have the, the unseen queued up? The unseen demo? We do. Okay, let's go to the demo and then I can bring in Chad. So Chad, you can, you can get ready, sir. Thank you. Something happened. through a series of air vents on all fours. As she passes, the transmitter in her ear directs her to the roof of the building. Afsana is near the top of the ductworks, crouched while watching the sunset. Her eyes are closed, but she feels the warmth of the sun on her face. We see the moon between the vents. By her feet 
are a series of schematic drawings in the dust of the duct. The earpiece is buzzing with data, and she assesses the information as she plans out her next several objectives. We see the drawings have been wiped away as Afsana hoists herself onto the roof. A pipe along the side of the building allows her to climb down to the ground. Troops are moving in the opposite direction, and she moves unseen. Afsana runs, but the outline of her body is nearly impossible to see, like a fingerprint on a piece of glass. Excellent. Very nice. Very nice. So that was a sample of Chad Allen's Unseen. Um, so this symposium today is all about adapting comics for blind and low vision readers, yet Chad, you're a content creator who's starting from a non-visual place. So um, can you talk a little bit about your approach to making comics? Sure, thank you for having me. I, um, I you know, I think we all start as consumers, uh, you know, and eventually uh, probably get inspired to uh, come up with a way to have your own ideas expressed. Um, uh, as a kid, I was sighted, um, so I enjoyed comics very much. Um, it's funny, I also remember uh, I received as a gift one year um, something from uh, Peter Pan Audio, which is in another old, old uh, uh, audio uh, comic uh, interpretation um, that uh, was made in the late 70s, early 80s. And it came with a small 45 record um, and the uh, comic book illustrated. And you would put the record on and the beeps would follow you from panel to panel. And then those panels would be performed by different actors. And the one that I had as a child um, was uh, Spider-Man meets the Wolfman. And it was about a, um, an astronaut that found a moon rock and he turned it into a uh, pendant uh, that he wore around his neck and when the moon was full he would turn into the wolf man and spider-man needed to deal with that situation before he destroyed the city um so you know that was kind of subconsciously in my head um you know for a long time uh till it started to resurface uh i went blind uh as a result of retinitis pigmentosa so uh slowly uh but surely and, um, you know, connected with the blindness community, um, you know, became very knowledgeable in the skills of blindness and, uh, you, you know, uh, pursued my art as best um, I could at the time. Uh, this was mostly uh, magic and uh, fine art that I was doing then, uh, but eventually that evolved into uh, writing. And um, I thought about that a comic book that I had was as a kid and wanted to try and, you know, play it a around with that idea myself. Um, so I can also used to play a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons and different kinds of role playing. So character development was something that I was very comfortable with. Um, I started with the character and then I created the world around her. Um, I knew that she was going to be blind um, the first attempt at writing, uh, she was male and I uh, changed it to female. Um, and then uh, as a result of a lot of the political things that were going on in the world, um, I wanted to uh, play with making her Afghani. And uh, which also I think as an artist is a good thing to do uh, to put these uh, kind of uh, Easter eggs of sorts into your work, things that you find interesting, things that you want to learn yourself um, more about so that um, it drives you to keep moving forward. So um, you know, I was a history major in college, uh, spent a lot of time researching, and then slowly but surely started gleaning ideas uh, through that. Um, I also, uh, you know, missed comics very much because I wasn't able to access them and there was uh, a lot of, um, you know, lack of availability. Um, but once I went into the movie theater and was able to experience a Marvel movie with audio description, um, I remember it very uh, clearly. Uh, one of my favorite characters uh, was Dr. Strange. So to be able to reconnect with that world again, um, was a very um, uh, uh, meaningful experience for me. 
Um, and I, I kept thinking, well, if we, I can do it in this format, what's to say it can't be done, you know, in a more readily available way, um, like an audio drama. And so things started to evolve and uh, eventually, um, you know, people started to take notice of the project and um, here we are. Excellent, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sure. Rick Boggs. <laughs> I'm glad you're with us, Rick. Um, I'm going to ask you this question, but then take a take a moment before you answer the question to uh, to give us your your introduction, if you would, please. Um, but I will ask you the question um, because you are someone who has been producing audio description for probably about 20 years or so. Um, can you talk about the experiences making AD for film and television, live performances, and all of that that can help make a medium like comics accessible? But again, please uh, give us your introduction as well. Almost all of your question until the last couple of words there, the critical part of it. Okay, so so really, I want you to talk about your experience um, within audio description and make you know all the stuff that you have done within audio description, whether it be films, live performances, and and all of that, um, and what we can kind of take away for for in the, in terms of making comics accessible. Thank you. Yes, sir. And, uh, always happy to, to be with you, Thomas. I um, am privileged uh, to participate in this, and what a what a wonderful uh, collection of of uh, intelligent human beings have been gathered here. Uh, uh, kudos to uh, uh, L.K. Longmore Institute for uh, putting on uh, this kind of a thing for a subject matter that might not get as much attention as as it really deserves, and I think. Um, but I'll, I'll do my introduction first, as you said. Um, so uh, Rick Boggs here in, in Los Angeles. Um, and, oh, let's see. I guess we're doing the uh, uh, audio description, uh, self-descriptions. Uh, yes, sir. I'm a, uh, you know, 58-year-old guy. So I got some gray in my brown hair and, uh, you know, about... 5, 10, 150 pounds wearing it. I'm pretty cash today. I was working out at the gym this morning and never went and switched and, you know, working at home, not doing the formal attire. So uh, I'm trying to remember what t-shirt this is, but some kind of promo painted t-shirt kind of thing. Um, I'm a, I'm a sort of a thinner wiry guy and uh, I, I uh, clean shaven in general. And, uh, but um so that's kind of where I'm sort of casual for the event. I think if it was in person, I'd, uh, I'm comfortable wearing dress clothes. I like wearing suits and ties and that kind of stuff. So that's how I would be dressed if we were in person, but being doing the home thing, it's a little more cash today. Um, as far as my uh, disposition and relationship to blindness and to the topic at hand, uh, I am, uh, let's see, totally blind since 1968 when I was, five or six years old after seven eye surgeries for detached retinas. Uh, no one knew why they were tearing apart. Um, and uh, some now world renowned specialists in those days, they were young, ambitious doctors, up and comers, uh, flew to UCLA to do surgeries uh, on my eyes and, and uh, ended up coming up with a couple of terms for diagnosis based on symptoms, they really didn't know what it was, you know, high, high myopia, progressive myopia, they had different names for it. Uh, but no one really knew why the retinas detached and, and um, in some kind of a, either routine or eye infections, for some reason I ended up, oh no, I do recall actually what it was. I read, <laughs> kind of interesting topic. I was um, with a woman for many years and we were going to have children and she became concerned that my children might be blind and I couldn't tell her yes, no, or maybe since I didn't know why I was blind anyway. And this is now when I'm 29 years old. Um, so I went to an eye doctor, uh, Dr. Mimi Chang, who looked at all my history and surgeries and all that stuff and was blown away by the celebrities that I had apparently been uh, worked on. Um, and so she encouraged me to go back to the doctors that had done surgery all those years ago, which I did. And they, uh, ophthalmologists, uh, Dr. Eifrig and University of North Carolina, Dr. Strassma at USC and UCLA, uh, Dr. Pettit, a large retina researcher, um, and talked hey, to them. Rick, they were very, yes. 
I don't. I this sounds like a great story, but I just want to make sure we have time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you, friend. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I got off on the tangent there. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, being blind that many years, um, you know, your your relationship. All right, audio description. Look, I've been a part of a lot of research and uh, about description. A lot of questionnaires. Been been uh, privy to research done by the Video Description Research and Development Center, and. You are relate a person's relationship to their blindness absolutely impacts their relationship to audio description in general. And naturally we could apply it, we could talk about how that fits with whatever's being described, whether we're talking about a museum, a cruise ship, or in this case, comics. And I can tell you as a young kid, my brother, uh, younger brother Kevin, read the comics to me. You know, we, we'd buy comic books, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, uh, and he would describe the the images and the pictures and i knew you know what the words were written that he would read those but then there was so much more than just the words right the comics are graphic um i got into audio description 2001 and uh, was very fortunate to get an opportunity to start describing for broadcast television in 2002 been doing it ever since uh you know some pretty major broadcasting cable networks have been serving them for all these years made it my mission to employ to include blind people in the production and, and, and determine the quality of description. That was really my, as an actor and voiceover artist for many years and, you know, long sort of history as a creative history as an artist in many ways, um, acting voiceover, music, uh, producing commercials, uh, radio DJ and degree in broadcasting and music and all that kind of stuff. Um, had a record label when, when a captioner told me I should get in description because I was doing advocacy work with WGBH during the 90s. Um, and, but I, what I, what my experience in the entertainment industry was that people with disabilities were getting short shrift. And I was able to present that one time in 2004 to collect a bargaining agreement uh, session. So uh, what I'm saying is that impacted the way that I run the audio description company. You know, my company, Audio Eyes, has been, describing since 2002 and you know has one of the top few shares of, of broadcast description that there is but but really what interests me these days after doing this 20 years isn't so much the same old movie the same old tv series the same old whatever but the special projects doing the blue man group doing uh um shows uh independent films like no ordinary hero where there's comics involved in the movie, some of the content. And I really wanted to bring a sample of that today. I, I couldn't pull it together in time, unfortunately, but maybe I'll make it available on the on our YouTube channel so you can see how we did it. But the movie was partly done in comic book style. And and then there was there were uh, deaf characters that were signing, there were speaking characters that were, you know, I mean, it was a, quite an incredible mix to try to figure out how to describe. And my business partner, Terry Grossman, Grossman um, and also Jack Patterson and I just sort of became enamored with the difficult challenges in description. What's difficult and how can we, how can we make it work? And we came up with a couple of concepts, uh, concepts for comics. Um, uh, we described some graphic novels that was related to this work. Um, and one is kind of a, a variant on audio description and we adhere to the standards published by the American Foundation for the Blind. Um, but those standards have to be modified depending on what the medium is that you're describing. And uh, there, are, there are kind of principles of audio description that I have taught through the Describe Caption Media Program, DCMP, and the website dcmp.org. Um, there are webinars still there archived that you can see where we talk about general principles of audio description. I will say, though, that comics, like other special genre, require kind of modifications and adaptations to the, to the specific application and the design of audio description. And comics in particular, because the graphic images help tell the story in a nonverbal way. Yes, there's text, but if you just read the text, and it's interesting, my son, Sean, who's 13, the first uh, graphic novel he ever read, he read to me aloud. He even noticed, you, you, I wouldn't get the story if he just read me the words on the page. You have to understand not only what's being shown in terms of this character is doing this, like who's doing what or whatever, but more than that, 
the style, the way that they're drawn, the, the way that the action is illustrated, the nature, the color, the technique, the, the aesthetic of the graphic images contributes to the story. The character of the person is portrayed in image rather than in word. And to have that described is super challenging because a lot of times if you're reading something that is uh, not that doesn't exist in the natural world, you know, when we, for example, describe the Star Trek series, uh, Discovery, <coughs> you have to come up with how do you describe something when you don't have any time or you don't want to make a novel out of your description every time. Um, and yet it's something that you can't just say it's a car because it's something that doesn't exist in the real world. So comics present this challenge. And there's, um, well, it's, it would be pretty hard to try to, you know, to teach it here, but I can suffice it to say, we came up with variants on how to describe and changing some of the basic rules and principles of description in order to do that as one way to approach it. And then finally, the other way is by soundscape. If you can match a soundscape and we have a, a blind uh, engineer, it's one of the, just a master editor. He can compete with anybody as some film, well-known filmmakers have told me, um, Chris Snyder, who uh, can create sounds and soundscapes to accompany a, uh, a version of audio description and, and voiceover and a, and a telling of the words. So you have three things. You have voices that you cast specifically that are reading the text that's on the page. You have additional audio description that might be fragments or might be a little more um, literary or sort of artistic or stylistic than rather super literal accurate description that we would use for TV or film. And then you use a soundscape, which is a combination of uh, music, digital sound processing and or effects that we use to try to choose the color and nature and tone of the images that are being portrayed. So that's my really long, inefficient explanation of uh, sort of where I came from and why, what I like about this and what we did about it. Thank you, sir. No, I think those, those last words. You're gonna have some more time when we get to the best practices, I think, to, to bring some more of that. So um, I want to bring Charity in. Um, Charity, with your, with your work that you described, I imagine that you have had opportunities um, to really hear back from consumers. So I got a two-parter for you. Um, yeah. What feedback have you gotten from the user community that could provide some value to adapting comics? That's the one, and I'll give you both. Do you want both at one both. time? All right. both. You may have to repeat the second one because I, I sometimes, you know, get a little, uh, you know, get a little lost after no I've problem. been talking a while. So, no uh, so, so why don't you, you just start with the first one? I'll jump in you when you're done. Start with the first one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I would say um, one, um, you describe um, came out of the V, uh, the VDRC, the Video Description Research Center. Um, and uh, it's um, an amazing uh, program that allows um, anybody with a microphone and a computer to add audio description to YouTube videos. Um, and we do not pretend that we are professional um, audio description, although we do have um, some amazing professional describers. Um, JJ Hunt um, has one of the most uh, viewed and requested videos um, at you describe which is an AD version of Childish Gambino's This Is America, um, which is incredible. And you should check that out at youdescribe.org. Um, again, JJ Hunt is the describer and it's Childish Gambino's This Is America. Um, but what we usually do are the kind of videos, the kind of content that would be left undescribed. Um, and a lot of that content is, um, is uh, entertainment. Um, most of our descriptions that are done are actually educational. Um, they're done by TBIs, but our requests for content are um, almost exclusively entertainment. Um, we have a lot of uh, requests for um, funny cat videos, right? Cat videos are the currency of the internet. Um, and these are very brief videos that get uh, traded um, and get sent out. Um, we have one describer who only describes like three to four second videos, the kinds of videos that you would send as a react um, to a text. Um, and he describes them. He has over a hundred described videos of these very short um, two or three second uh, bits. Um, we get a lot of uh, asks for movie trailers, um, which are especially difficult to describe 
because they are often very rapid fire images um, with a big, uh, heavy score um, and a lot of soundscape um, that there aren't a lot of pauses in um, to make descriptions for. Because while the movie will be audio described, the trailer isn't. Um, and you know, people want to, they want to see the content. They want to be excited about the movie. Um, one of uh, my very favorite uh, describers is a woman, um, Melissa Hope, um, and she's a professional script writer. And she did uh, one of the most beautiful pieces of audio description that I have seen. It was an intro uh, for Picard, um, which is a Star Trek um, franchise. Um, and it's a very poignant, um, very sort of slow moving, image rich uh, trailer uh, for that series. And I think her description is all of eight sentences long and it is just on point and brilliant. And um, that was very beloved. So I would like to say to content creators that uh, there is a huge demand um, for, uh, for this kind of work, for some kind of non-visual translation of comics. Um, and every kind of comic that you can think of, people want access to. Very cool. So what about the second part? <laughs> so the second one, yeah, well, well, shout out to JJ Hunt and, and, and Melissa Hope, two great professionals. I know them both and they're very cool. But I know you work with some novices. I and you do. help them, right, you help them begin that process of describing. So what are some of the suggested techniques for getting started? So uh, for getting started, um, one, we ask people to, to pick things that are manageable. Um, and as people think about how they're going to start, um, as content creators think about how they're going to start um, translating uh, comics into a non-visual form, I, my big suggestion would be to start small. Um, when we ask people as brand new novices to describe something, we ask them to start um, with a two to three minute video, no longer than that. Um, and the reason for that is that when you are creating the entire description yourself, you're doing all three parts. You are writing the script, you are the voice talent, and then you are also the editor. Um, and of course, a professional um, describer team, those, uh, those things are usually um, pieced out you know, to people who are like fantastic editors, right? Or people who are fantastic voice talent, um, you know, people who are professional script writers. And at You Describe, you do it all yourself. Um, and what we hope is that you will come up with something that is, um, if not the most elegant, um, fun and serviceable, um, and that really invites people into that video. Um, and that your, um, your personality, your, your love for the content um, is going to shine through. And that's the other big thing that we, that I suggest. But if you're starting as a new describer, that you describe content that excites you, um, that you're super interested in. And that kind of um, excitement really makes for thoughtful, meticulous describers. And uh, we, we used to get maybe one to three audio descriptions a week. Um, and, uh, and now um, I think our record was we had 125 videos posted um, in one week. Um, it used to be that I could um, watch every audio description. I could view every video and give feedback. Now there are too many. I, I can't watch them all. Um, people are putting up entire movies. I do not have time to, um, to quality check an entire movie. But once people have done um, five to 10 audio descriptions and gotten used to the sound of their voice, gotten used to the fact that they have, you know, maybe a local accent, um, that they really love creating audio description and are good describers. Very cool. Um, I'm gonna make an audible here. Wale, I wanna to go to you um, before I bring in this other subject. I want you to, can you talk about uh, some of your thoughts and experiences with both existing platforms and, and other mediums that could enable comics and, and uh, facilitate access? Absolutely. Um, 
So um, I think there's, there's more um, tools available to us that maybe weren't available, you know, 10 years ago, or even maybe five years ago in terms of, um, you know, producing, uh, there's digital audio workstations that are accessible, such as Logic. And if you don't want to pay for that, there's GarageBand, right? Um, there's Audacity and, and all these other audio production softwares that folks can use um, to create audio description. Um, there are also tools for us as blind folks to get the information that we need, right? Um, you know, visual interpreting surfaces so that we can figure out what's in the video that we're trying to describe, or if it's our own video, we, we hopefully know what's in it. Um, uh, or if, you know, yeah. So, but in terms of maybe um, some other ideas, um, you know, using what's out there uh, is also never a bad start, right? Um, I'm thinking about just web pages with images that have all text, right? That could be simple and you could also do that on social media, right? You can do that on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, you know, post images of pages and describe the panels and, and the text. Um, going beyond that, you know, there are other social media platforms uh, that are more interactive, like Clubhouse, which is purely audio. Um, and you could probably create a room on there and just start reading comic books to folks, right? That, that, uh, and describing the images in them. So that, that's also a thing. And I could see that actually becoming more, you know, um, just becoming uh, somewhat successful on Clubhouse because it's an audio medium. So I, I could actually see not just blind folks showing up to that, but also folks that are sighted and just are listening in and maybe um, doing something else. Uh, um, I mentioned graphic audio earlier, and I hope I'm not wrong in saying this, but I once heard that like graphic audio is their main market are truck drivers, right? Um, which was funny to me. Um, but, uh, you know, people who are sighted also need to consume audio. So I could see Clubhouse being, um, you know, a, a good medium for that. Um, one more medium that I think is not on a lot of folks' mind when it comes to audio description or comics or even accessibility. Um, it's a guilty pleasure of mine. Um, and I haven't explored it too much yet, uh, but it's TikTok, actually. Um, TikTok is a medium that allows you to create and edit your own videos. You can add text to them. You can add voiceovers to them. You can add voiceovers to other people's videos. You can take somebody's video and stitch it, right? And so now we get into a place where, uh, you know, there's a potential for us to be adding audio descriptions to social media posts, or we can have, you know, uh, pages uh, uh, up on, you can add images to your video instead of having an actual video, you could just put up an image on screen and describe that, right? That could be a page uh, of the comic, uh, com from comic books. Um, and finally, I think uh, going back to older kind of existing mediums, I think PDFs are notorious um, on the internet um, for just being PDFs and for not being accessible, but it is possible to make an accessible PDF, right? Uh, or an ebook. Um, so there is that route that folks can take where they can actually just uh, make the, the, the whole comic book accessible as a digital document of some sort. Thank you, thank you for that. And yes, truck drivers are definitely, uh, long haul truck drivers are definitely uh, consuming audio description movies as well. So you know, I love that clubhouse idea. Um, Chad. Hey, Thomas. Yes. Thomas, this is Emily. Can I make a brief interruption for an sure. access note? Absolutely. Um, a note for our captioner and anybody using captioning, there's a, a big delay. It's still quality service, but um, there's a big delay. So Lisa, I'm not sure if there's any way to fix that problem. Um, I think the panel can proceed. It's, it's just a, a delaying about a minute behind. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, so Chad, um, what are yes. some of your thoughts about developing best practices to, to help content creators make accessible comics? And, and by all means, share anything specific from your own work. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to make one comment about uh, a couple of things that were addressed earlier with the other panelists, um, uh, especially with regarding uh, the trailers. Uh, I recently was listening to a podcast and the group was talking about 
how they use closed captioning when watching movies because of the ways that movies are um, recorded now that sometimes the dialogue is difficult to hear and they use that closed captioning as a tool even though that they are cited. And um, the comment as well about the truck drivers. Um, I spoke with a uh, Lyft driver uh, not too long ago and how uh, he used audio description uh, through Netflix um, to listen to movies while he was doing his work. And I just think that, um, you know, accessibility obviously is our biggest interest, but at the same time, um, you know, people are reading dialogue from movies through closed captioning now. People are, you know, reading transcripts of podcasts now instead of listening to it. So having the diversity, I think, is just a good thing overall. And I think that we're going to find very quickly uh, that uh, other people besides us are going to enjoy uh, these descriptions of these graphic novels. As for best practices for me, um, I would say, uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, follow, follow your, um, you know, your interests, your desire. Um, if I never wrote down my ideas, um, Unseen would have never been made. And so I think just, you know, having the confidence to sit down and say, you know, even though I'm not a writer, if that's, you know, kind of mentally where you're at, um, I'm just going to write this down and play. I'm going to explore these creative ideas that I have and see what takes shape. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, this stuff can't necessarily work in a bubble. So once you do share and you feel that you have something that is um, interesting, um, I strongly recommend sharing it with people, whether it's, you know, close friends that you trust or family or spouse or even online with strangers, if that's something that you feel confident in doing and, and getting some feedback, building on that idea. Um, and then from there, if you can get people excited about your idea, which is exactly what I did with Unseen, I started getting people involved in the project. And uh, the more people I had, the more skill sets that were brought to the table to get this vision uh, created and uh, out into the world. And um, slowly but surely, it started to take shape. It was a very organic thing. Um, I used very little money, but a whole lot of favors to get this to happen. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am a magician. Um, you can check me out at chatallenmagic.com. And the reason I say that is because, um, you know, magicians are performers. They have, and sometimes they have wonderful voices. So um, as a member of the uh, Magic Castle and the Academy of Magical Arts in, in Hollywood, California, I would ask the magicians of voices that I liked the most. And many of them ended up being performers in my comics. So um, Max Maven, for example, was Dr. Magnus. Um, my friend Misty Lee, who's a female magician, she played Afsana. Um, Vanessa Stewart, who is um, uh, married to French Stewart, uh, she's a very um, you know, successful actor in her own right. And my wife went to school with her, so she did all the wonderful narrations in the project. Um, we found relationships with a, a sound studio that was willing to um, you know, basically give us the space uh, because of um, our relationships and our, our friendships and our network, along with the, um, you know, the prospect of us being able to have that on exhibit at the museum. Um, but I, I think you know, the most important thing is to keep going. Um, you know, I said that I started this project in 2015. It's 2021 now. It still has legs, it's still evolving, it's still growing. And um, I think a lot of that has to do with just, you know, keep putting things out there. Um, I hope that answered your question, but if you want me to clarify anything else, I'd be happy to as well. No, I, th I think that's good. I think we can, we can definitely glean some best practices from that. Um, Emily, real quick, I just wanna know, do we have, a, do we have a, any questions in the Q&A just so I could keep track of that? 
Do we yes, we do have a few. We okay, have about okay. four. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I want to make sure we get, we get this in. Rick, um, quickly, do you have some thoughts on best practices as well? Because Chad was sort of from the creator point of view. I was wondering what you what you think about best practices. You there, Rick? You're on mute if you're if you're speaking. Oh, you. Uh, he's you unmuted go. now. Go ahead, okay. Rick. Okay. okay. Yeah, that takes me a while to get to that, so thank you for doing that. For me. And then I got to turn off the screen reader and all that kind of stuff. Okay. I think the most important best practice is to respect the audience, and by that I mean whatever method you use and whatever principles you follow in providing a comparable experience for a blind consumer. Always be conscious not to insult them, talk down to them, assume that they don't have the capacity or that you need to explain things that can be otherwise understood. I think the, the um, greatest, the most common failure in audio description in general on the part of people pr providing the service is that they don't become familiar with what a blind person would do without description. How well can you do without it? There are many programs you can follow and understand and whatever and blind people know we've been watching tv and films long before description came around and the best describers are those that really get a sense for what you can do with your uh, by listening and by paying attention and drawing conclusions from what you hear um, and so there's no need to duplicate uh, or you know be redundant in whatever you're doing um, so I think, again, best practice, uh, don't be condescending, don't talk down to, don't assume that because a person is blind, they're not going to understand. Instead, try to become aware of what would it be impossible for a blind person to know just by what they hear. Um, and so how does that apply to comics? Well, um, I would start with a standard audio description um, practice of, of reading the text that that is on the page, um, whether digital or, or uh, analog. Um, so reading, as we say in television and film, reading all the text on screen is a must because someone's not gonna know it's there. Unless of course a narrator in the program on TV says it, but in the case of comic books, you gotta get all the text. Beyond that, you've gotta get the core elements of who's doing what and in what context, what environment, right? Just the nuts and bolts of what's happening. And then, what I would call the aesthetic, the artistic flourish, the a little more subjective uh, detail <clears throat> that suggests more about the characters and more about the story that isn't spelled out. But you got to do all that with the idea that you can dispense with any attempt to help the blind person understand the story. That's not what you're trying to do. And I, I as a blind person, and a lot of the research that we that we did in 2013 through 15 you know, confirm that a lot of blind people feel the same way, particularly people that have been blind for a long time. It's, it's irritating to me to, for people to be telling me something that I can tell already by just by paying attention. So I think that's the most important best practice. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, Charity, so you describe, I mean, you guys really focus a lot on videos, so, but I'm wondering specifically what role can you describe play and, and the crowd you know, um, you know, the, just the 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 audience sort of thing, right? That you guys kind of right. focus on, um, right? Yeah. How how can how can you describe play a role in this, and specifically well, for comics? Yeah. Um, I I think Rick is right here on on the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that um, one of the things you know that I teach new describers, um, which are going to have a lot in common with um, with uh, comic creators um, who are going, um, you know, who are just starting out, you know, who are well-intentioned and want to be helpful, um, you know, to avoid the pitfalls of, you know, overdoing, over explaining, like just over. Um, and most of our really good describers are either TVIs, one, because TVIs are amazing people and they have a lot of experience um, uh, being allies and, um, and, you know, understanding what their students need. But the big thing about them is that they're very clear on their audience, right? They know when they get a video, who is going to be viewing it. 
um, and exactly what educational content um, you know needs to be um, you know highlighted um, and the things that can be you know sort of dropped away. Um, and I would say that right now um, with this as a new medium, that anybody who's starting off with this, even though um, right now it's a little, um, you know, frontier, maybe Wild West, <laughs> like, what is it going to be? How is it going to be done? You know, what are the standards going to be? Um, that putting out some very clear and basic guidance is um, from the get-go, you know, the things that we already know, um, you know, should be broadcast, you know, liberally, um, so that people who are well-intentioned, you know, can create, you know, good content. Um, and the other best practice uh, that um, I think comes from you described um, is, uh, is inclusion. Um, because we describe things that aren't normally described, things that are not big budget, things that are um, not sort of mainstream. Um, as we, you know, build this um, community um, around, you know, comics and graphic novels that we remember um, to be inclusive, that we include, um, you know, quirky voices and, um, you know, voices with accents and that absolutely um, that the blind community should be first and, you know, in front um, of creating um, and editing and, uh, you know, and doing, you know, everything, you know, with regards to this medium, that, that we, we cannot make this, you um, accessible if we do not include um, the blind and vision impaired community, but we also need to be including the queer community. Um, we need to be including um, people who are, you know, end up kind of on the fringe if we only think about DC, if we only think about Marvel, um, you know, that there's lots of graphic talent and comic book creation that's done uh, by the queer community, by the kink community. Um, and, um, you know, and by other communities that really also need um, to be described. Thank you. I love that. I love that. Um, perfect. We can go to some, some of the questions, because um, I think, Emily, you said we had about four. So let's see who we, what we got. Yeah, we have a few more coming in, too. So we'll okay, see how many we can get to. Um, if each individual's experience with blindness or low vision is unique, then how can we think about creating a cohesive kind of accessible audio format? What sort of elements would give us a sliding scale of accessibility? For example, rather than a one size fits all experience. Hmm. Anybody want to take that? Does that sound like anybody has something to say about that specifically? Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. I think I hear Rick. <laughs> it's like Chad is jumping in actually. Is okay. Yeah, I would just um, like to say, I think that um, the way technology is moving so fast, um, we are uh, gifted with new uh, innovations and abilities on a regular basis. Um, so yes, I think that, um, you know, there are certainly fundamentals that need to be put in place, but um, if it's too rigid, of an idea, then it doesn't uh, necessarily lead for, um, you know, new innovations to come in. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, my experience, you know, for example, with accessing magic books has been very difficult because very few of them are, you know, in, a, in an accessible format. Um, but now with the artificial intelligence that's on the uh, phones, um, a lot of those image-based uh, uh, documents that were once inaccessible are now accessible. So um, I think it's good to talk about it. I think it's good to understand the likes and the dislikes. And, um, you know, there are definitely some rules not to break uh, as far as um, how audio description should function. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's, uh, it's a moving target because just the way technology evolves. I think I'm and if I can add to that, this is Wale. Um, I think that um, there is a lot of room to grow here. And I think, you know, my high level answer is that the only way for us to find out is to, you know, 
keep making audio description and keep getting feedback from the community as much as possible. I think it would be, um, and maybe there is a place for this, but I think it would be interesting for a website that where folks can rate the audio descriptions of different, um, you know, movies or TV shows. Um, but to add to, to one more thing about that is um, an idea from an experience I had, there's this dance company called Kinetic Light. And um, for their performance, which is highly visual and has zero dialogue, they created multiple audio description tracks. Um, some of which were very much telling you what you were seeing specifically in, in, in non-metaphoric ways. Some were a bit more um, uh, metaphoric, you know, and, and some were like a story. And then there was one track, I think that was just the sounds um, amplified. Um, so there's, there's maybe a way to, you know, maybe make multiple audio description tracks to fit Met, you know, uh, a few different groups as needs. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. That was actually, I was making a note. That's Automance is the name of their technology. And this is, you know, the whole idea behind technology is that you can be more inclusive and just create more choice. And that's a, that to me is a perfect example of that. So I'm glad you raised it. What is that called? Automance is the name of Automance. their technology. Yeah. Cool. You can check it out on readmymind.com. Just letting you know. Will do. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, you want to go to the next one? Sure. Um, if a superhero is given an actor's voice, does every story thereafter have to have the same actor in order mm. to maintain characteristics uh, similar to how you'd want a similar illustrator for, for a comic series? I want to go to Rick for that one, because that's I mean, that's that's something that happens within audio description right now in movies and, and, and uh, shows. Rick, you want to talk about that one? All day long. Yes, sir. <laughs> that, uh, <clears throat> in general, the feedback from blind consumers. And I love the question, by the way, that was asked the last question about since you have varying opinions and there was a lot of good research done by the American Foundation for the Blind about people, how uh, a person's blindness, their relationship to it and how that impacts their opinions about description. And I got to the point where I could look at results of surveys, questions that people would have answered on a questionnaire. And then I could tell you this person been blind a short line or, or they've seen very little description or they've been blind a really long time or whatever. You can tell by people's opinions, those kinds of things. And so um, we, we, we try to play what we call play it down the middle. There are people like me who are minimalists. We like, just give me the, what I absolutely need to have description kind of people versus usually the newly blind want fill in. They'll even say, fill in every possible nook and cranny and gap that you can in the, in between the dialogue with as much description as you can get. Right. And you got to, in a, in a flat one-dimensional technology world, you've got to, in your script, in your plan, kind of play, I say, down the middle, give some to these and some to those. And now technology, as we were just talking about, is wonderful, that the more that um, technology offers us multiple tracks, I love that that is a solution. I think, I think it's a, a really good way to go. To answer the current question, I'd say that uh, the research that, that I've seen, most consumers do prefer to keep the same voice, uh, particularly when you're voicing you know, subtitles and doing character voices and things like that, keep the same voices for the same people because it, it can be confusing if it's shifting. Um, on the other hand, uh, a lot of people liked what we did with Blind Justice on ABC where we did male voice for one episode, then a female for the other. We had the same two people, but we alternated back and forth between the two and had a lot of favorable response. So you're going to get a diverse opinion. I think it is a good practice, though, um, to keep the same voice for the same program or the same voice for the same characters, you know, to try to have consistency over a series or over, you know, seasons and seasons. I think it does add, uh, uh, you know, a certain level of familiar familiarity and consistency for people that maybe aren't as dedicated, hardcore, watching every single thing or whatever. They kind of know what they're hearing. Um, and you know how it is. A sighted person can see a little glimpse of a show that they know really whatever, and they'll see familiar images, and they know right away. Oh, that's uh, you know that's Grace and Frankie or whatever it is. Um, and I think you can give a blind person that kind of experience if they hear the audio or they or or a voice and know. Oh, that's probably what that is. So I I think it's a good practice. I don't think any of the rules or principles of description or one size fits all for every scenario. I think you have to be flexible. You have to be creative if you're gonna do a great job. But in general, I think it's a good practice. Yeah. 
know you want to jump to the next one. Can do. Yeah. Um, as a sighted person, I wonder how I can learn more about the right balance um, between enough description and the right kind of description versus too little. And this, there were a couple different folks who were just sighted people wanting to get more involved. So just looking for resources and ideas to learn how to how to dive in, which is exciting. Great. I think we should go to charity for that one. Start at least charity. You want to start with that question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so um, if you, um, when I teach uh, audio description, um, and uh, sometimes that's as short as um, uh, an hour long, you know, Zoom webinar, um, and sometimes uh, it's very in depth and it, you know, covers a week or so, um, there are different ways to handle it. But if you are looking um, to uh, translate uh, comics from an audio description standpoint. There are going to be other methods, you know, throughout the day. Um, I would really uh, recommend that you come over to you describe, um, and I will I will help you, you know, um, because it takes about an hour and a half to do your first audio description. It takes a while, um, and the people who get good at it, you know, do more than ten because you're going to make mistakes, um, and you're going to need feedback on it, um, and so that is a good place to, to practice um, and get feedback. And our viewers um, rate, they give a star rating. And then they also tell you if it's over-described or under-described or your, um, you know, your uh, mic isn't clear enough um, or you don't speak loudly enough for the descriptions, even with the ducking feature, right? Like you can get some very good feedback on an audio description way. Um, you know, just by practicing. And it's a good place to practice, right? Um, so there are other places and other ways to do it, of course. Um, but audio that you describe is free. It is available right now. And if you want a tutorial, we can start next week. I think you cut off that last, that last part, at least for me, cut off, Charity. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, it's just, it's free. Um, and uh, if you contact me, cpc at ski.org, um, I will hook you up with um, very basic audio description techniques. Um, we at You Describe have a YouTube channel where we have videos. There are eight of them that walk you through very basic audio description um, uh, do's and don'ts. Um, and um, it, it can be really easy to get started. Excellent. Thank you, Charity. And sort of a related question for folks wanting to dive in. Uh, there, somebody posed that they have a lot of audio description and voice acting experience, but they're wondering if we know of any opportunities for diving into audio description for comics and graphic novels. And that might actually be a question that's more for our, our attendees today. If any publishers are looking to sync up, this is why we're sharing the directory and we're using the Facebook group. But does anybody have any comments on that specifically? Um, I don't know if this has been mentioned, but I just wanted to shout out the audio description discussion group on Facebook. There's a lot um, going on there and, and people can uh, get a lot of useful information. Were those the only questions or? There are more um, oh, okay. and we have four minutes left. So yeah. up to you how you want to run it. <laughs> um, you must take one more and then you know, we'll see if it's a quick one and then we can uh, close it out. Um, sure. Sounds good. How how about, I'll, I'll just summarize it. Uh, how do we feel about the pre-recorded, I mean, the computer synthesized voice versus voice <laughs> That actor? is not a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was doing the quick version of it. <laughs> okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose the person here. I'm going to go to Wale. Wale, what are your thoughts as a consumer? in terms of synth and specifically we're talking about four comics so i'm curious for comic books okay yeah. um yeah. i'm gonna put it out there that i have a bias i am not a fan of tts for audio description um i do know that it maybe it has its use cases but um you know i think the comic book answer is would be the same answer for all of the content i consume which is, I, I just, I prefer a human voice. There's something about the delivery. 
the inflection um, that, you know, even the most robust TTSs, I don't necessarily, I find them to be a little monotone. And um, while they have advanced and they, they do sound great, um, and I use screen readers every day, I prefer my audio description to be read by a human. Is there anybody who wants to quickly talk about the opposite point of view? I would, I would oh, not the uh, necessarily opposite point of view, sorry. Okay. Anyone have the opposite? If not, then Chad, go ahead quickly. Okay, uh, I would just wanna say, I think the goal um, you know, of any description or any storytelling experience is immersion. So if it immerses you into the story, it's a good thing. If it takes you out of the story, then it's bad. So if there's multiple actors performing, um, that might take you out even for a moment to adjust to the new person. The synthetic speech may not feel intimate enough and I think that that is uh, a problem when the purpose of storytelling, I would assume is primarily entertainment. Excellent. Chad, real quickly, where can folks on uh, social media, where can, they, where can they learn more about you? Okay, um, all my magic stuff is done through chatallenmagic.com. Um, most of my uh, social media on Twitter is also uh, at chatallenmagic. Um, but if you're specifically interested in the Unseen Project, um, I, my recommendation would be to go to unseencomic.com. It's all singular, all one word, unseencomic.com. And that'll have the information about the exploratory, uh, exploratorium, um, the exhibit. Uh, there'll be a sample um, audio uh, of the um, unseen experience. And then uh, any future events that are taking place would be uh, listed there on that website. Wale, same question. I, mean, I can present it. Uh, has new opposite viewpoint. Wale? Yep, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And my handle is at corrupted site. Uh, that's site as in S I G H T, <laughs> at corrupted site. <laughs> Rick Boggs, where can folks learn more about you, audio eyes, et cetera? AudioEyes.com, A-U-D-I-O-E-Y-E-S, AudioEyes.com. You can, uh, there are forms there to contact us. There's contact information if you want to talk. I just, uh, I, by the way, did want to, sorry about my screen reader there. I did want to say, I couldn't get the mute. I'm so slow with the screen reader on this particular platform. But the opposite viewpoint that you were looking for, I can tell you this. If I was doing a graph, if I was doing a comic and it was, futuristic and it was non-human you know primary odd characters if it was very let's say space based or something like the expanse or like star trek or something if there were creatures if it was you know uh what's it called star wars if you're you know that kind of thing i could definitely see how incorporate deliberately incorporating uh a synthetic voice uh could contribute to the appropriate aesthetic of the program so i just want to say there are cases in which i think it could add to the program, but in general, I have the same opinion as anyone else. So anyway, Rick Boggs, um, uh, you can't be at audioeyes.com or rickboggs.com, R-I-C-K-B-O-G-G-S.com. Fantastic point, sir. Charity. Um, one, I just want to say thank you so much to Thomas. Um, this is one of the nicest panels I've ever been on, um, and I was very intimidated. Um, everybody here is um, an audio description heavy hitter and uh, um, I thought I would have nothing to say, and I'm so grateful um, with the thoughtfulness of your questions and really including me. Thank you so much. Um, and you can find You Describe at Y-O-U, um, and then Describe, and of course I'll probably spell it wrong, D-E-S-C-R-I-B-E <laughs> dot org. Um, and I'm available at cpc at ski dot org. Um, C is in charity, P is in pitcher, C is in Cooper at ski, S K I dot org. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for this. Uh, my name is Thomas Reed. Again, my podcast, Read My Mind Radio, wherever you get podcasts, just spell it correctly. It's R to the E I D, like my last name. And I'm at T S R E I D on Twitter. Emily, take it away. Thank you so much. This was, this was a lot of fun, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. So much, Thomas, Thanks, everyone. for moderating. Thank you all of our to all of our panelists. We are now going to have a brief break until 11 a.m. Um, you can just walk away from the computer. You don't need to move any different Zoom link. You're going to just stay here. We're going to have some light music playing, and we will see you back at 11. 
uh, and our panelists um, will be looking for you uh, and promoting you to panelists. So um, uh, make sure that your name is visible for our next panel. Thank you all. See you at 11 Pacific time. <laughs>